Welcome to Worship for Mothering Sunday, this the fourth Sunday in Lent. It's good that we are able to gather together in this way at the moment. We're all separate, but together we are united in our love and prayer and brought together by this single act of worship, which we can watch in our own home, knowing that others too are sharing in it. First, let us gather ourselves together as we reflect upon the nature of God with the Christian song, Faithful God.
Faithful God, a hymn which reminds us of the love of God, continually faithful in whatever circumstance we find ourselves. So our call to worship for Mothering Sunday. Under your wings you would hide us, Mothering God. Under your wings you would shelter us, Mothering God. Under your wings you would warm us, Mothering God. Under your wings you would nurture us, Mothering God. So we come to worship you. And we sing the hymn, Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven. So let us pray. Loving God, you father us and mother us all our days. Even before we acknowledged you, you loved us. You laboured to bring us to birth, new birth, and how joyful for you was that birthing. In the secret places of our lives, you nourish us, offering us the feeding that we need to grow as human beings. No matter how often we desert, desert you, you never turn your face away from us. And your abiding concern is always for our good. You weep for us. You laugh with us. You rejoice in our successes and our anguish in our pain. Yours are the arms reaching out to cradle us when we collapse in death. Loving, mothering God, strong and tender, tried and true. We worship you today. Amen. A reading from John chapter 9, 1 to 41. As he walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's work might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. 
As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Then he went and washed and came back, able to see. The neighbours and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, No, but it's someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, Then how were your eyes opened? He answered, The man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought the Pharisees, the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus had made the mud and opened his eyes, and the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. He said, He put mud on my eyes, then I washed, and now I see. Some of the men said, some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. He said he is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son, that he was born blind, but we do not know how it is that he sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age, he will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, He is of age, ask him. So for the second time they called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, Give glory to God, for we know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, though, I was blind, and now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he has come from. The man answered, He is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not for God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born entirely in sin. Are you trying to teach us? And they drove him out. Jesus heard they had driven him out. And when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, and who is he, sir? Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and the one speaking to you is he. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment, so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would not have sin. But now that you say we see, your sin remains. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. So we come to our next hymn. The Lord, my shepherd, town ends version. Let us sing. The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. He makes me lie in pastures green. He leads me by the still, still waters. His goodness restores my soul. And I will trust in you, and I will. 
of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be worthy of you O Lord our strength and our Redeemer that long reading from John about the man born blind is always very current we only need to look at the news or around town or in our own lives to ask the disciples question who sinned and thus caused this to happen today let us set aside all of that uh, wonderful theology from John and his powerful metaphor of spiritual blindness and focus on this question how can an all-loving all-knowing and all-powerful God allow totally undeserved suffering to exist in the world that we believe God both created and loves the question is a hardy perennial been around since folks started thinking about what it means to have only one God who is just loving and true so far there have been no really satisfying answers, no nice neat conclusions. But the question persists, it has to, to ask this part of what it means to be a thinking, engaged person. In fact, we human beings seem to be wired in this way. Things have to happen, they must have a reason, an explanation, they have to make sense if we're going to wrap our minds around them. So Jesus saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? There it is, that hunger for some explanation in the face of tragedy, pain and suffering. 
especially tragedy, pain and suffering that apparently makes no sense, that we can neither understand nor justify. And we know about this, we know that much of our pain and the pain in the world is hard to understand. It's like the fate of the man born blind, it just happens. So we all ask our own version of who sinned, this man or his parents. We ask why there is so much pain, why people, especially good people, get sick or get hurt when it isn't their fault. We ask why so many die so young. We wonder why families so often do not work out the way they should work out, the way everybody wants them to work out. We wonder about earthquakes and tsunamis and health crises. We wonder about a lot of things. The disciples wanted to understand this tragedy, and with it, other tragedies. Of course, if the man had become blind because of his own carelessness, or if someone else had blinded him on purpose, then it would still be a tragedy. But it would make more sense, it would be easier to deal with. But that's not what happened. So, the disciples ask their question. <clears throat> <clears throat> One of the traditional answers in Jesus' tradition has been that tragedies such as these are a case of God visiting the sins of the parents on the children. Both Numbers chapter 14 verse 18 and Deuteronomy chapter 5 verse 9 say this specifically. And it's become a common proverb, the parents have eaten the sour grapes and the children's teeth are set at edge. The parents sin, the children suffer. While this isn't particularly reassuring, it is at least something does offer an explanation. It shows how God, who's been part of everything, could also be part of this. But there were problems with this answer. It just didn't feel right. Many of the great thinkers in Israel's tradition, notably the prophets Jeremiah and Ezekiel, flatly and very specifically denied this. They insisted that God did not skip generations, that God treated people as individuals and not as heirs of someone else's sin. So there was a contradiction in the tradition. It was a puzzle. By and by, some other rather ingenious teachers came up with an interesting alternative. Perhaps, they speculated, a child could sin while it was still in the room. Being born blind would be punishment for that sin. Again, whilst this was a really weird explanation, it was at least some sort of answer. There was some justice to be found, some sense of it all, even if it wasn't good. Even if it wasn't good sense. Even if it felt less right than all the earlier answers. So when the disciples asked Jesus the question, they were asking Jesus to choose between two standard traditional answers of the ancient question, why? They were asking for an answer to the ancient cry for meaning and justice. It's important to realise that what Jesus did when he responds to this question, first he rejects both options, and in doing this, Jesus is rejecting all explanatory answers to the question of why. He doesn't say, no, that is not the reason, but this instead. And this is very different. Jesus refuses to make sense of this situation by explaining it in terms of either divine will or human sin. And so he rejects the explanation that bad things happen because the victims are bad, or because the devil makes them happen, or because people don't have enough faith, or because they don't pray correctly, or whatever explanations people have come up with before and have come up with since. Neither Jesus nor the Christian faith offers any clear, rational, sensible explanation of senseless suffering. Neither Jesus nor the Christian faith gives us answers to the problem in the way that we want answers. Instead, we're left with the brute fact that we live in a world that really isn't fair. A world that is marked by ambiguity and inconsistency. A world that is dangerous. We live in a world where tragedies happen for no apparent reason to folks who absolutely do not deserve it. And the point is that we just have to have enough faith, then these questions won't matter, or will somehow understand without an answer. But the questions do matter, but we will never understand to our satisfaction, and it doesn't do any good to pretend otherwise. But that's not all Jesus says. Jesus says two more things. They are not answers to the question of why, and we make several important mistakes if we treat them like answers. The first occurs when Jesus says of the man born blind that through him the work of God can be made manifest. That is, the place to look for God is in the tragedy, or in any tragedy, is not at the front end of it causing it to happen. 
God won't be found there, sitting in heaven, passing out cancer cells, birth defects, earthquakes, strokes, car wrecks, blindness, like some hideous dealer at a high stakes cosmic poker game. Instead, the place to find God is in the middle of the mess, in the very worst parts of it, working there to bring forth something new, not something that fixes the mess, but something that redeems and transforms it. The God who is found there, the God who is active there, he's the God who has wounds on his hands and feet and side. It is the God who knows, who cares, who remembers what suffering is like. The God who shares our suffering and pain, who takes it into himself in the vastness of his compassion and love. Remember, please remember, this is not an explanation of what happens. God didn't poke the man's eyes out before he was born so that it could be handy for Jesus to use as a sermon illustration. That's not the point. Because if it's not about love, it isn't about God. Instead, the point is that God can be found in very real ways, in transforming ways, in the very heart of undeserved and inexplicable pain. That's the first thing Jesus says. The second thing Jesus says is we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Notice Jesus says we, we must work the works of God. Tragedy, pain and suffering are also calls to ministry and service. This may or may not mean a call to fix what the problem is. Often we cannot simply do that. But it's always a call to reach out and care. It's always a call to discover to bring, to share the presence of God in the heart of tragedy. Note that this isn't an explanation either. Terrible things don't happen so that we have the opportunity to minister and serve. God doesn't work that way either. But the call to such ministry and service is part of Jesus' response to the reality of tragedy and suffering, not a rationale or a justification of them. These two things are what Jesus says to the question, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? They're also the way Jesus responds to our cries for explanations. For us Christians, what makes sense out of the world and our suffering is not answers or explanations. Instead, what makes sense out of these is the presence of God of compassion and love, along with the opportunity to serve. What makes sense out of tragedy is not that we understand it, Instead, it's that God has taken it upon himself, that God is present in it and through it, that God calls us to love him and to serve him and to find him in our own pain and in the pain of our brothers and sisters. This isn't the explanation we asked for. It certainly isn't the answers we want. But it's the truth. It's honest. And it promises that we matter that our service and care are important. It promises that we are never alone, never forsaken. God is indeed with us, even in the heart of the very worst. And that, finally, is enough. Amen. And so, let us have a pause for reflection as we listen and watch this video with a piece of music.
And so let us come to our prayers, our prayers of intercession, our prayers for ourselves and for each other and for the world in which we live. Let us pray. Let us be still, let us be silent as we reflect upon the time that we are having, the situations in which we find ourselves, the needs of the world. Let us offer to God those people and places and situations for whom and for which we are concerned, naming them aloud into the silence, praying for our families and our friends for whom we are concerned. Pray for the situation in the world and praying for all those who are becoming sick, those who are bereaved, those whose loneliness has been compounded by self-isolation, those known to us, members of our churches, who find themselves shut in, away from their family, their friends, and for whom this is a lonesome time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And let us pray for those who are sick, sad, sorrowful, confused by the things of life, the everyday things which carry on even though the world has shut down, all those situations that concerned us before, all the difficulties that we carried and the weighty things that bore on our minds and in our hearts. They're still there, and we offer them to God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for the churches throughout the world, gathering in strange ways, in the ways that we are gathering here, and pray for each other, knowing that we do so together yet separate, knowing that God holds us in his arms, and his spirit flows between us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And let us pray for the world in all its needs, where there is poverty and pain, warfare and want, joy and richness, pleasure and delight, knowing that God is with us in all of those things. Praying, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer and so merciful God accept these our prayers and all those other prayers we have in our hearts and in our minds not as we ask on our ignorance but as we know that you love us in Jesus Christ our Lord you taught us when we pray to say together to say our Father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And now let us sing together our closing hymn. How great thou art.
worship for today to a close. Let us say the words of the grace together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, each one, now and always. Amen. Thank you.